All right, so we'll start our main act for the day. So our featured speaker is Gina Darren here. Um, Gina is a supervisory senior environmental scientist with California Department of Water Resources or DWR. She's the division. She's in the division of integrated science and engineering's tidal habitat restoration section. Gina is the past president of the California Invasive Plant Council, or Cal IPSI, which is why she has great announcements and knows a lot of info about it. Um, before working with DWR, Gina worked with the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Noxious Weed Eradication Program and Weed Management Area Program. Uh, Gina received her master's degree from UC Davis, where she worked with Dr. Joe DiTomaso in the Weed Science Lab to develop a GIS-based weed eradication prioritization tool called WIPIT. And currently, Gina and her team of environmental scientists are working to research and enhance uh, tidal habitat restoration in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh, including revegetation studies at Dutch Slough and Bradmore Island and the Blacklock Restoration Phragmites Control Study. So we'll get to hear more today from Gina on her team's strategy to prevent the establishment of invasive vegetation in these studies. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to present today. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and get to share all this wonderful work that my team has been doing over the last Oh, this is math is hard six years. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, so the the reason that my team embarked on this work that I'm going to be presenting today is this this big question. And I'm going to I'm going to hopefully answer the question <laughs> by the end of the presentation. And the big question is, is there something we can do at the design phase of restoration planning to limit invasive species establishment? or after a restoration site has been taken over by nasty weeds uh, using an IPM approach. So I'm gonna spo spoiler, most likely yes, but here are some uh, examples and I hope to convince you of that as we go along today. All right, up first, this work that I'm presenting today is, is a team effort. <laughs> So uh, I first acknowledge that the areas where we did the work was the traditional land of the Patwin and Sassoon people. They managed the land uh, prior to our arrival and we are hopefully now managing the land in the same, uh, with the same goals in mind of keeping our ecosystem healthy for everyone. The research team was made up of the Department of Water Resources folks and uh, UC Davis folks, and my project managers for all of these projects were Jamie Silva, Rhiannon Mulligan, Krista Hoffman, who you've met before, uh, JT Robinson, and Madison Thomas. Uh, we got field and lab support from the California Conservation Corps. There's uh, one of the crews, uh, and Saul, can you see my cursor? Yeah, let's see, I think so. I have a laser pointer, cool. Um, the CCC crews, they're a lot of fun to work with. Uh, we have support from Solitude Lake Management, the Bright Chemistry Lab, the WEC Lab, and the Sassoon Resource Conservation District. And a huge shout out to our funders for this work. We uh, received two Prop 1 grants from the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy, and then the rest was funded by the Department of Water Resources Fish Restoration Program. And big thanks to the managers of the Department of Water Resources who see value in doing pilot studies like these in order to improve all the work that we're doing and then share this information out in forums like this uh, so everyone else can learn from it too. Today we are going to talk about tidal restoration in general, uh, what is the fish restoration program, uh, and I'm going to point out that invasive species are an ever-present threat to all restoration. Uh, we'll go over the invasion curve. Uh, what research is happening? So revegetation and control studies at Dutch Slough. There's Dutch Slough right there. Uh, and Bradmore Island um, using a using competition as an IPM strategy to help prevent establishment of invasive species, hopefully. So we'll go over that. Uh, we'll talk about a restoration reboot. <laughs> That's the Phragmites control study um, using herbicides and mowing to look at off-target impacts to water quality, food web, non-target plants, 
uh, to make sure we're doing the work the most effective way with the least amount of chemical to get done what we need to get done. And then we'll talk about implementation of all those studies. Uh, I know we have a Q&A question and answer section afterwards, but I don't know if you want to pop in with a question, I, I'd be happy to make this a little more casual back and forth. And then I know some of you are uh, going to have a DPR quiz after the fact, so I'll uh, try to point out some things along the way. Might be useful. All right. Oh, that symbol, that's going to pop up. Something to pay attention to for folks who are particularly interested in that part of the agenda. All right. So um, actually hearing uh, Shoba and Jesus chatting right before, I was like, oh, maybe folks don't know where this work is happening. <laughs> I'm in Sacramento, uh, West Sacramento, which is uh, here. And y'alls are probably off the map in San Francisco area. So this is a, a map of the legal delta. And so when I say the delta, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, Sassoon Marsh is here. And uh, the bay is out, out, out in Disa way. Um, so when I talk about the Bay Delta, I'm talking about the whole thing. Uh, so for me, I, I pretty, I'm a very visual learner. And when I saw this map, I was like, obviously that is a duck. No, so, no choice. <laughs> I get a little background noise. But that's all right. We're going to power through. Uh, this is the Sassoon Marsh is the head of the duck. Like obviously, right? Oh, yes, and then yes, this yes. is a duck in flight. So um, just sometimes I use this image to orient people I'm like the head of the duck, the back of the head of the duck. That's where Bradmore is. The neck of the duck. That's where Dutch Slew is. I'll, I'll show you. But anyway, I get a kick out of that. So the fish restoration program and re title habitat restoration general. What am I talking about? All right, so when I talk about the fish restoration program, that's a thing. I'm going to probably call it FERP. So when I say FERP, I mean fish restoration program because FRP is a different program. So we're FERP. Uh, this is a joint program between the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, state agency, and the California Department of Water Resources. And we are working together to meet a mitigation requirement for the state water project. So the state water project is run by the Department of Water Resources, and this is the movement of water in California from uh, Headwaters and Oroville Dam down through the Delta and then into the aqueduct at Tracy and then down the aqueduct out to the Bay Area, y'all, down to the Central Valley farmers and then Southern California. Our terminal reservoirs are Paris and Castaic. So that's, what, that's the state water project. And you can imagine a lot of environmental damage was done to put that thing in. So the 8,000 acres of tidal, hab tidal wetland habitat is one of the mitigation requirements for the Endangered Species Act compliance for the department in order to uh, hopefully put some balance back into California. Uh, and what is 8,000? This, this is a map of where we're at. Well, there's Sacramento. There you all are in San Francisco. This is the extent of the map here. And so these are the Restoration projects, this one, Lookout Slough, is 3,000 acres, it's huge. Um, the yellow ones are still in construction or in planning, and the green ones are constructed. Um, not 100% sure on the acreage split there, but we're aiming to have all this constructed in the next two years. Uh, I put Blacklock in there, technically not a FERP site, but DWR does own it, and I'm going to be talking about it, so I stuck it there. And it's kind of like yellow green because it was green, but then I think we need it's yellow now because it got it got real invaded. Anyway, we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, this is just an ex, uh, extent of kind of where the projects are, and this is all totaled about just over 8,000 acres. There's one over there. Oh, Dutch Slough is over here. I'm going to be talking about it. It's not a FERP site, um, but they lent it to us for our study, and it is a huge department uh, restoration site. It's right there off of Big Break. Okay, what is 8,000 acres of newly available fresh habitat? Say it with me. This is habitat for invasive species to come in if we don't do something about it ahead of time. So uh, just want to point out that um, wetlands are an incredibly important component of our natural environment. Historically, we had a lot more than we do now. And one of the greatest challenges in maintaining uh, a habitat restoration site 
is managing non-native species. Uh, and so I'm going to go over the present of the dominant invaders we're talking about and what we're going to do about it. So just want to reiterate that invasive species management is a major stressor and a very significant cost in maintaining tidal habitat restoration sites. All right, the invasion curve. This is the conceptual model that guides much invasive species management planning. And in my mind, when I'm thinking about IPM, I'm thinking about the whole system. You know, some folks focus on the control part of doing the work, and that's IPM, making sure you have all the different tools and you're using them in concert so as to minimize your uh, use of chemicals. Chemicals are a very important tool, and I will uh, advocate for that till the, till the day I die. But um, all the tools are very important. Uh, but when I talk about IPM, I'm talking about the whole system, including planning and all the way through to monitoring. And so this concept of the invasion curve is incredibly important when you're in the planning stage of your um, invasive species management project. So let me orient you here. So going uh, along the x-axis, we have time passing. And then as uh, we go up the y-axis, you have acreage or area infested increasing as well as cost increasing. All right, best, most cost effective method of invasive species management is prevention. And there's a lot of folks doing a lot of work there. Um, the species is not, is not here. At, at some point in time, time point zero, a species gets introduced. Now, most species that are introduced, we have a ton of introduced species are not native species. Uh, all of our crops, uh, a lot of our ornamentals, these plants don't cause a problem, but there's a few that get introduced that are going to cause harm. And when I'm talking about an invasive species, I'm talking about something that's typically not native to the region, although as we're gonna see some native plants can be tipped out of balance in their ecosystem and turn weedy. Um, but usually it's a non-native species and they are um, spreading without human assistance. You know, some crops aren't gonna survive without our intervention. Invasive species will survive without our intervention. Not only will they survive, they will thrive. So they will spread and then sometimes they spread and they don't cause any harm. It's not really a big deal. We don't really care about dandelions. They're not hurting anybody. They provide pollinator uh, food, great. There are some that will get out of hand and cause harm, either to humans, to the ecology of the region, or economics. So things like yellow star thistle, that's a good one. Um, that meets all the criteria for being an invasive species. So when I talk about invasive species, that is what I'm talking about, that kind of thing. All right, something gets introduced. You have this window of opportunity uh, for eradication. We call this that early detection and rapid response. Whew. Is really, really important. Uh, this is when you have a very small number of populations and you could probably get it. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't notice plants until they're past this stage. Uh, then you're um, getting a very rapid increase in distribution. Uh, alligator weed is this way. We can talk about that another time. Um, containment might be your only hope. And uh, at some point, there's really no hope of eradication. The plant is maxing out in its population curve, uh, very abundant, and you are into long-term management mode forever. Uh, and then an asset-based asset protection mode. So for example, in a sea of a nasty weed like water hyacinth, there's no way we're gonna get rid of it. Uh, but what we can do is protect our restoration sites. Uh, so protect our high value assets and then what control methods you're going to use will then come into play there. So uh, figuring out where you're at on the invasion curve with a given species is important to knowing how you're going to manage it effectively. And early detection and rapid response is the um, best strategy for minimizing impact and it's the most cost effective strategy once a weed is uh, identified in your in your management area. All right, let's get to it. So the uh, pilot studies, uh, we had uh, two revegetation pilot studies on uh, tidal wetlands uh, in the Delta and, and the marsh. So the reason we're doing uh, revegetation studies is because there's a lot of evidence in other systems, especially like grasslands, where uh, they support that 
uh, revegetation can be effective in suppressing the reinvasion of a site. Uh, so this will uh, reintroduce competition and hopefully keep fill a niche and keep the invasive species at you know out or at least keep it from becoming too harmful. We want a diverse vegetation community community for a lot of reasons. Um, a monotypic stand of anything is not good for anything in, in my opinion. Um, all right. Uh, there weren't very many revegetation studies in tidal wetlands when we started this process, um, so we took what we could find from upland and terrestrial systems and applied it to wetlands. And um, the objectives of the study were both to reduce the rate of aquatic vegetation species establishment in our restoration areas to improve fish habitat because it is the fish restoration program, but I think it improves habitat for all taxa. But also we were monitoring uh, the cost of these things because 8,000 acres, you scale that up, that ain't cheap. Uh, so what can we do of all the methods we're going to test, which are the most both efficient and cost effective? So we we're also keeping track of costs um, so we could scale up. All right. Let me introduce you to the invasive plants that we're talking about today in these studies. So this one, it's, it's like a yellow flower floating mat you might be familiar with. It's called a water primrose. We're 99% sure we have Ludwigia hexapetala. There are some native primroses and they are a couple different invasive primroses and they're hybridizing. So it is very challenging to figure out what you have, but when it does this and it acts weedy, we're, we're going to call it a weed. Uh, again, this is a is floating. Oh, this one. It floats, but it also broods. It can also grow on dry land. This one is this. This one was my nightmare until we met alligator weed. Um, Phragmites uh, is a very very tall grass. That's me. Um, I'm five eight, <laughs> so that's me standing measuring some Phragmites. It's called common reed. Phragmites australis, technically native. But there is a European Eurasian biotype, so same species, but genetically a little different um, and they're very almost impossible to tell apart, except I think by how they act. Uh, so this is an emergent. So when I say emergent, emergent, I don't mean like it's up and coming. <laughs> I mean like it sticks up out of the water, <laughs> like it emerges. That's what I mean when I say emergent. This is a problem mostly in Sassoon Marsh. And then during the during our study, alligator weed was discovered in uh, the Delta in 2017. And then in 2019, we found it in our study plots. Um, so we're adding alligator weed to our list of weeds to hate. Uh, this is, a, oh boy, I, said, I called it emergent here, but it does all the things. It can float, it can you know, root, it can em be emergent, and it can grow up on dry land. So this is like the weed of nightmares. The heroes, the native plants. Uh, these are the plants we chose uh, for our active revegetation stock. Uh, we wanted a local plant because so we don't want to mess up with the genetics. We also know these are already adapted to the area, so great. We don't want to introduce anything. Um, they are the hardstem bulrush, which is the very tall Chainoplectus acutus. Um, and this is, uh, and then we have a smart weed, even though it's weed in the name, Persicaria amphibia. This is a native plant and it, it uh, does all the things too. It grows uh, rooted, it can float on top, it's uh, leafy. It's, um, so we were hoping this one would out compete or at least compete with uh, water primrose. Uh, we have another bulrush. Uh, this is uh, Chanoplectus americanus. It's, it's shorter, but it grows real dense. Um, it has, it's so edged. Um, if you cut it, in cross section, it has like a sharp triangle edge, and uh, again, not <laughs> may the fourth be with you. Not a huge Star Wars nut, but I'm told that it looks like the Imperial shuttle in cross section. So for those of you who would appreciate that, there you go. Uh, and then cattails as well. Again, a uh, weedy, very robust, effective native to outcompete the non-native weeds we don't want. All right, so let me orient you to the study location. So the, the head of the duck, remember the duck and the delta? Here's the head of the duck. So Bradmore and Blacklock are at the back of the head of the duck. Uh, Dutch slough, 
is in the kind of the neck of the duck. Um, and then, you know, going out to the bay here. Oh, there's Vallejo. There's Pinnell. Berkeley. There's Berkeley. <laughs> Calypso used to be in Berkeley. Now they're in Oakland. Okay. Let's zoom in on Dutch Slough. So uh, if you imagine, so here's Big Break. Hey, Seuss, you know this area. Um, so this is a giant three acre or three parcel restoration site. This picture is a little old. Um, they haven't started working on the third parcel yet, but they have breached. So this is an active tidal wetland site now. Uh, our study site was this uh, little spit off the tip of the third parcel. And this was, um, this is a zoom in of, on the study design, at least the layout of how it was supposed to look on the land. Uh, this was the very first drone image taken by DWR's new at the time drone team. So uh, adding drones to the IPM toolbox is very cool. Uh, so just uh, what we did here is um, we harvested tulies on site for our revegetation material on the, on the other side of this, this little levee here. Um, we didn't, while there is smartweed at the site, there wasn't enough of it. It was kind of mixed in here for us to feel comfortable harvesting it and moving it around. So one of our other sites from that big map of the fish restoration program, Prospect Island, oh, it had a sea of smartweed. So we went there and got it. All right, and we so we did um, four different treatments of um, different, uh, we did tulies by themselves, smartweed by itself, and then a mix of tulies and smartweed. And we had one unvegetated control. So that's to simulate, hey, we're gonna clear the weeds, but we're not gonna actively revegetate. We're gonna hope passive revegetation works. Doesn't, um, at least here. <laughs> and uh, so we replicated that four times in three different blocks, in these three different areas. All right, so once uh, the experiment was implemented, this is what it looked like standing from the levee. There's that, that it's kind of as the tide comes in, <laughs> it covers up the, the spot. But we had the weeds cleared from these areas. The Division of Boating Waterways helped us, and then the CCC crew helped as well. Uh, we cleared the weeds from the plots and uh, planted them out. Oh, the CCC crews, they're fantastic. Uh, these are uh, a lot of young folks who are just learning about uh, conservation work. Um, and a lot of times they're clearing trails and making fuel fire breaks. This was very different for them. And let me tell you, we had a great, great time. So here they are harvesting the tall bulrush toolies um, on site. And then we would uh, we planted them out. Um, they're staked in here because it is a active tidal area. We don't want them to wash away. Uh, so what we did, and you can see there's space here, it's because we learned in the terrestrial grassland restoration literature that if you plant out at 25% of the density of your reference site, then in a year or two, you should fill into reference site density. And so your reference site is, you know, somewhere you want your place to look eventually. Like, we want it to look like that. Okay, how many stems per square meter? 25% of that is what we planted. All right. Oh boy, you have to really be ready for anything. I'm learning adaptive management on these, any any project. All y'all who are project managers know this. Um, we had a surprise come in uh, to our plots. So you can see our treatment markers here and the colors are uh, which which treatment it was, which species were planted. Here's a, a good chunk of our planted tulies. They're, they're, they're senescing, they're not dead yet. Uh, anyway, this thing here is a floating dock. So this dock floated in and landed smack in the middle of one of our blocks in our plots. And I'm like, oh, so, um, you know, we do our work at low tide so that we can get in there and do our measurements and monitoring. And um, we noticed that this dock had this uh, foam. So we've been using these pallets to walk on because it is mushy mud out there, um, real, real tough to walk in. And so we harvested the foam. We, you know, take advantage of your resources and uh, use the foam to float the pallets <laughs> to make it easier to walk on. And then at the next high tide, our project manager, Jamie Silva, Jamie, thank you so much, swum it out and tied it off outside of our project area. <laughs> oh, it was, oh, yes, it was. Uh, thank you, Jamie. It was an effort. Um, all right, so that's it. Oh. I see that we have a, a hand raised, or I thought we did. Louise, did you have a comment you wanted to say? 
Sorry to No, I was trying to applause. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> it was a great use of resources and swimming it out with a good invention. So that was it. You know, awesome. thank you for that. Yeah, you do what you can. All right. So that was fun. Yeah. So for some reason, the Delta Conservancy didn't want to didn't want to pay for boogie boards for this project. I don't know. Um, not covered by Prop One. OK. So that was Dutch. So that I'll tell you how that turned out. But first, let me tell you, I told you that story to tell you this one. OK, so now we're going to the marsh. Uh, this is Bradmore Island. And then right next to Bradmore Island is uh, Blacklock that we'll be talking about. Uh, this right here, this parcel is Arnold Slough or Arnold. Uh, this is a huge. Uh, so Black, uh, Bradmore is a huge restoration site for the fish restoration program. Just breached last year. So this picture is uh, of it before it breached. Actually, it doesn't even show it on Google Earth breached yet. Arnold breached uh, the year before, so now all the this is wet. Um, now you can see this was historically a wetland. Uh, we restored it. Woohoo! It looks awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, here's Black Rock. Another question? Nope. Okay. Oh, Chris, that put in the chat, but we did get kayaks. They did. No, I don't think did they pay for the kayaks. I can't remember. You think you're going to remember all these things, but yeah, we did get some sweet kayaks that we're using, um, mostly for black clock. We'll get there. OK, I'll show you a picture. That uh, circle was this study site. So we uh, this is a managed wetland at the time. We hadn't breached yet, so we were able to dry it out and we disked a one acre. So we as if like this is a fresh restoration site. We've disked an acre. This is Ted Broschultz, our UC Davis uh, principal investigator who helped us out on the project. So for scale, uh, this was us prepping the site. This was the study plan for this one. So this, because it was a managed wetland and we could dry it out, we had a little bit more control. Um, and so we decided to test two things here, not just what species uh, would be easy to actively revegetate and hopefully keep out the weeds, but what stage of life. So we tested in a split plot, block design, three different, it's hard to see, three different uh, life stages, so seeds, uh, rhizomes, and adults, and again we left um, a chunk empty for control, and then uh, we also tested here, we tested the tall bulrush, um, Chanoplexus cutis, the, the, the Star Wars bulrush, <laughs> Chanoplexus americanus, and Typha latifolia, the cattails, uh, and then um, this is how we, we, we planted them out in a larger plot, but we only sampled in a couple of places inside and to be consistent inside each of the, the plots. So lots more fun to be had when you work with a CCC crew. Uh, they did um, all the work of harvesting the tulies and digging the, the trenches and planting them out and staking them out. And, oh, good times. All right, so this is how it looked right after we implemented the, the treatment. So you can see the four different blocks and um, you see we had adults planted out. Those are easy to see. The rhizomes um, are a smaller like, chunk of rhizome. That's the underground part of the plant. And then uh, the seed treatment, we uh, mixed the seeds with the binding agent. It smelled like gingerbread uh, and then we, we put it out there. All right. So one of the things we were hoping was that um, the sites would get invaded and we wanted to see how well the different plants resisted invasion. Uh, at Dutch Slough, uh, the primrose came back right away, right away. I mean, we did a little gardening to get the plants established, the, the new transplants, but primrose just, just bolded over. Um, and then at Bradmore here, we were hoping the Phragmites, which was our, our invader uh, at this site, would, would move in because it was all around. And, and this is Anthony. He's holding up a swimming rhizome. And we so we give Phragmites uh, an A for effort, but it didn't actually <laughs> invade the plots. So we got a lot of information about revegetation techniques. We didn't really get as much on um, invasion resistance, which is what we we're hoping for. But, you know, when you have three years of grant money and you're uh, to hold into the elements. Uh, sometimes these things don't work out how you hoped, but we can imagine how it would have gone. So um, the study results are that um, active revegetation and competition are still important 
integrated pest management techniques that will help you limit the use of herbicides in the long run. Let me say that again. Active revegetation and competition are important integrated pest management techniques that will help you limit the use of herbicides in the long run. And this is a stem count, so number of stems um, over time. So this is two years of data. And you'll see in the different lines are the different treatments. And I'll tell you, this is the hard stem bull rush. This is the tall one. So adults and rhizomes. So we thought like adults would do the best, right? But they're actually really finicky to plant because you can't break the stem and you got to stake them in. And it was a lot of work. So when you get to cost effectiveness, the question of what is cost effective, at scale. Um, rhizomes did just as well in the end filling out the plots as the adults. The, the top, top two lines are rhizomes and adults. The seeds, the seeds never germinated. And we looked into possibly why, and it turns out tule seeds need like scarification and a cold treatment and all kinds of rigmarole that we tried to force them to do and got very little germination. So I don't know. The nature is smart. They can figure it out in the wild, but man, we, we had no luck with the seeds. Uh, so we uh, are recommending rhizomes as uh, of all three um, species did well as far as filling in the plots. Uh, rhizomes are going to be the most cost effective um, revegetation method for these species in these sites. So I was thinking about you all. Uh, because I was preparing this presentation and attending another, uh, the Sassoon Resource Conservation District had a landowner workshop. And uh, this group from the Delta, it's a, a group funded by the Delta Science Program, also did a revegetation study, also looking at uh, invasion resistance to Phragmites, and they had a different result from us. So I thought the invasion resistance seed mix or transplants, I can't remember what they did, um, would be the best. So hard stem bulrush was one of theirs. Um, these are the uh, species that they uh, planted, but they actually found that the their salinity drought tolerant mix, saltgrass, pickleweed, alkali heath, and uh, creepy wild rye actually did better as far as active revegetation. So um, they're a different site than we were, and I'm going to take this into consideration when we scale up. So the more species, the better. All right, this is, this is a heavy slide. Bear with me. I will have a brain snack for you after. Um, but it, here's what we learned from the revegetation experiments. So uh, even planting a robust native plant, it may have trouble getting established. So we had a small area at Dutch Slough and the CCC crew, oh, they were so happy. Yes, they did this cool work. It was hard work. They did it and the plants did not survive. Um, we think when the primrose was removed because it was holding the soil and the soil kind of washed away, we ended up planting our native plants deeper than we expected to. So they got maybe drowned a little bit. Um, Maybe they just didn't like where they were planted. Hopefully in a bigger area, you can um, have a little a better luck finding a place the plants like. But so that was one thing we learned. Um, we also learned rhizomes with emergent stems are the most cost effective option uh, for revegetation in tidal wetlands. We learned that from Brad Moore. Uh, pilot planting trials is a good idea before you embark on a large restoration project. So if we hadn't done the pilot and we just went for it, you know, we might have uh, had, you know, a, a rude awakening. So I would always encourage pilot plantings. Uh, we also learned that highly infested areas require repeated control before you do your revegetation. Re so we did one year of control before planting at Dutch. It was not enough. So what we were learning, and so we're going to plan for three years of control <laughs> uh, before um, investing in active revegetation. Uh, seed dormancy and germination, uh, think about that when you're choosing plants. Some of them just aren't going to germinate readily without some major interventions. 25% uh, planting density totally worked. We don't have to waste money planting it at 100% density. It'll fill in. They do their thing. It's great. Uh, so bonus there. 
a diversity of native plant species for active revegetation because just some aren't going to like it wherever you put them. So I'm really excited to use both our mix and then the mix that the other study found. Wetlands are super dynamic. There's floating docks floating in all the time. Um, Revegetation projects in these types of environments are going to require an adaptive management mindset. Um, so, and then like new invaders, here's alligator weed coming in. It's like, oh, <laughs> not another one. But um, we do what we can with what we got. All right. Are there any questions about the revegetation part before I move on to the control part? Oh, there's some things in the chat. Oh, those look like technical things. OK, cool. All right, I'm going to move on. And now for something completely different. I gave another pre I gave this presentation to the local weed management area in Yolo County and uh, enjoyed the rest of the talks in that meeting. And one of the talks brought this up and I was like, oh, I got to I got to tell my new friends at the San Francisco Department of Environment IPM series about this. In it says Steelhead Creek, it's the American River up in Sacramento. They're using draft horses to pull out invasive trees because you can't get heavy equipment into a sensitive riparian area, but these horses can navigate it and they hook this They're You know, the, the horses pull this thing and um, they can hook this to uh, around like a small tree, like a red sesbania or, uh, you know, something they want to pull out. Uh, it's too big for a weed wrench. And they're pulling them out. It's it's so cool. I'm like, there's an IPM approach. Anyway, just food for thought. OK. Moving right along. All right, so Blacklock. I'm really excited about this one. Um, so Blacklock, this is the Blacklock site. Um, it was the very first, and we're looking across to Bradmore. So actually, I wonder if our study plots are visible. So this is uh, across this slough is Bradmore Island right here. And then this is the the neck of the dog. I have another picture for you. Um, this is Arnold's slough right behind it. And then this is Blacklock right here uh, in, the, in the foreground. Blacklock was the very first tidal restoration project in Sassoon Marsh. Uh, it was owned by the Department of Water Resources. We bought it from Mr. Blacklock. That's why we named it that. He still lives nearby and loves to check in on us and see what we're up to. Um, this was a joint restoration project with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. It was originally uh, designed to be a habitat for salt marsh harvest mouse. There was a planned breach of the levee. It was a managed wetland. Uh, there's a planned breach of the levee uh, here at um, in 2006 but the island ever so helpfully breached itself that same year. And since we've done all the permitting and the, the, the hydrology modeling, that natural breach wasn't just gonna be enough. We ended up breaching it ourselves anyway. Unfortunately, the Phragmites was not controlled prior to breaching. There was a little bit of Phragmites on the site, not, not much, but a little bit. And um, when the site became uh, open tidal and the tide was allowed in and out every day, two high tides a day. Unfortunately, it drowned the pickle weed that was there. And the pickle weed is the food for the salt marsh harvest mouse. And it turned into open mud flat. Well, what happens when you have newly open habitat? Invasive species can get in. And that's exactly what happens. So all this fluffy green stuff is the common reed uh, of Phragmites australis, big tall grass. Um, so yeah, Phragmites proceeded to take over the wetland, encroaching on the tidal mud flat, and there were no permitted tools for Phragmites control in an open tidal wetland in critical endangered species habitat. This is a habitat for salt marsh harvest mouse, uh, rails, Ridgeway rail, black rail, and delta smelt and salmonids. No permitted tools. Until now, we'll see. All right, so my team does research projects like this to understand how to improve restoration outcomes and to meet the objectives for the fish restoration program. Even though this is not a fish restoration program site, it is adjacent to two others, and we want to do the good work and share the information to everyone dealing with these problems in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh and Bay. 
All right. Why do we care even about Phragmites? Well, uh, Phragmites has negative effects on native vegetation, fish and wildlife, I'll tell you some, for water quality and recreation. So these are the tules. This picture is tules. So you can see, like, this is the hard stem bulrush. It is a very upright form. Sunlight can hit the mud. Other things can grow under there, like this little grassy looking thing. It's not a grass. It's Mason zoleopsis. It's a listed rare plant. And uh, this is Phragmites. So you see it's very tall, bushy. Um, this is actually Phragmites behind me. This is us kayaking. <laughs> There's our kayak, Krista. Um, kayaking through this uh, wetland. Very bushy, very dense, uh, very dark under there. But look, there's Mason's Liliopsis under there. So I'm thinking that Mason's was there, the frag is moving in, and it's going to shade it out. We normally do not see anything underneath Phragmites. It's just a complete monoculture. Um, and so we've also did, uh, we did an observational study of, I'll share that in a second, um, looking at insects, so a higher trophic level um, between Thule's and Phragmites. Spoiler, there are fewer insects on Phragmites um, than on the native vegetation that we saw. Uh, it also could in affect water quality. Uh, there could be allelopathy, which is a, where a plant emits a chemical into its environment to make its environment host hostile to other plants, but better for itself. Uh, and then also impedes recreation. Um, it's really hard to kayak through that. This is a half an open um, spot we found, but I have, I have like cuts on my face from frag. All right. So. Um, just want to reiterate that Phragmites can absolutely negatively impact plant communities, water quality, and recreation. All right, so we care about Phragmites. We want to we want to get rid of it. We want to tip the balance back. Um, we did an observational study. Uh, I know this is a lot on one slide, but just I'll tell you the story. So we we're, we get, keep getting asked like, why are we paying for this? Why do we care about Phragmites? Does it even affect fish? probably uh, but we looked and so just um, I'll just draw your attention here so under on this graph again I don't expect you to read these but all these different colors are different um, orders of insects and the um, cattails are here the uh, tules so the different uh, bulrush and the, the Star Wars bulrush are here and this is the Phragmites and you can see um, there were uh, more colors more different insects and abundances higher in the desirable vegetation, the tules, than we saw in the Phragmites. So I think that is evidence as a proxy, even these are terrestrial arthropods, that that could um, be a proxy for other trophic levels in the community. All right. And why do we care about Phragmites? Well, I looked at the Cal Flora database. This is a wonderful free, they're doing their spring campaign today as well, um, a resource to us land managers to look at where plants live. So I did a search for Phragmites and uh, there's one, <laughs> one patch of Phragmites <laughs> documented in San Francisco. So you're not immune, but the majority of it is in the Sassoon Marsh uh, and you know this is the head of the duck and then also a little bit into the, the delta here. But that's where Phragmites is becoming a huge problem. I really think that in the freshwater system here in the Delta, that other plants are out competing it, like Thule's bulrush, because they're super happy uh, with their fresh water. And then in the Bay, you all have Spartina, <laughs> Alternaflora and hybrids. Um, so that's a, a very weedy, uh, nasty grass. That is a dominant invader in the bay. It, it can tolerate a lot of salt. But this this transition area where it's you know brackish, it could be wet, it could be salty, it could be fresh depending on the water year and what time of the tide. Um, this is where Phragmites is really expanding fast because I think it's just a little salt tolerant and more so than the Thule's that it's getting a competitive edge. Um, and then once it's get really salty, you don't really see it. But I think that's why Phragmites is here. And uh, and I know you care about us because you are caring neighbors. 
So thank you for hearing our story. Uh, this was another slide uh, from the Sassoon RCD um, presentations I was listening to and I thought of you all. So they're not only looking at uh, revegetation to outcompete Phragmites in um, tidal wetlands. Uh, these researchers are looking at the social and ecological management of Phragmites. And so I loved this. I thought of you. I screenshotted this. Um, they are trying to establish an integrated pest management approach for Phragmites control in all of Sassoon Marsh. And how they're doing this is not only using the, they're testing the revegetation, very important tool in IPM, um, but they're asking landowners, like, why do you control it or why don't you? So they're trying to find out, like, what's going on with the human component of this uh, effort? And I thought that was really insightful and very cool. And I'm looking forward to what they conclude, what they recommend for us managers who are really focused on the ecology and land management and maybe forget sometimes that humans are part of the part of the community. <laughs> All right. Just wanted to share that with you. OK, so the Black Lux study. This is very cool. So Krista Hoffman. Thank you, Krista. Designed the study. Um, and since 1999, uh, since there were uh, veg maps of the Sassoon Marsh, uh, Phragmites has increased 325 percent in the entire marsh here. So this is the head of the duck. Black Lock is here, the back of the head of the duck. Um, Here's another aerial view of Black Lock. Uh, no chemical control method at the time was currently permitted by the fisheries agencies in open, open tidal wetland. It's not a plant on the Division of Boating Waterways aquatic plant treatment list, so they couldn't help us. So our purpose of doing this study is to look at both efficacy, what is going to get rid of the Phragmites for us, but also what are the off-target impacts so that we could inf inform the, the fisheries agencies that you could do this work in a very targeted surgical way without causing off-target impacts like to water quality, contamination, um, food web. So the, the phytoplankton, it's an herbicide, it's gonna kill anything that photosynthesizes. So food web, phytoplankton, and then to zooplankton. Uh, and then um, off-target impacts. So the rare plants, there's other plants in the area. Um, you often hear about drift with herbicides. So we wanna make sure what are we doing and what techniques we were using, we're going to minimize all those off-target impacts and hopefully show the services that we could do this in a way that's not going to harm the critical endangered habitat for the endangered species, critical habitat for endangered species, and then they would permit us to do this at a larger scale. So um, Krista did all the work to get us all the permits uh, to do the study, which we were actually able to implement on the ground starting in 2019 with the goal of site-wide implementation. So this is a zoom in of the Black Lock study site. Um, uh, we got a NPDES. Uh, we applied for notice of intent to apply under the NPDES general permit for aquatic pesticides uh, with the State Water Board. And we got a biological opinion from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to do this study. Um, and then we also um, used a CEQA uh, exemption for small scale studies. And those were our, our permits. We contracted the work with UC Davis and Solitude Lake Management and WEC Labs. And then we had our very last drone flight in May 2022. I just have to tell you, this site looks like a Labrador head to me. Right? Do you see it? So here's the eyeballs of the breech. And then we got the ears. This is the ear. This is the neck and the collar. And then this is like the jowls and the nose. So when I talk about those things, you know what I'm talking about. Thank you. All right. So how did we do this? This is cool. That's why I want to share this with you. So uh, we designed the treatment plots to be large because this is a large clonal plant. It has a lot of, it, it's like a, you know how you get bacteria in a petri dish and you see it kind of like radiate outward? <laughs> That's what this plant does. You get the mother plant and then underground, it just starts spreading itself and then you pew, 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 all these things come out. So it, it feeds itself. So we don't want to treat like part of a clone <clears throat> and then have it feeding itself, you know, from outside. So we did these huge plots, 10 by 10 meters, so very big. And then we did our uh, monitoring because again, we didn't want edge effects of the Phragmites out here feeding the Phragmites inside 
um, hopefully catching a whole clone somewhere in this 10 meters. We only actually did measurements in the middle. So when you see our data, it's just this. All right, so we had, we ended up with six, uh, six treatments, one of which is an experimental control. That means we did nothing, which is always very confusing when you're talking about controlling a plant, but you have an experimental control where you do nothing. But that's how it is. Uh, we use the aquatic formulation of glyphosate and the aquatic formulation of amazapir and a non-ionic surfactant. We did that amazapir alone, a glyphosate amazapir tank mix, glyphosate in uh, with mowing, integrated pest management technique, amazapir with mowing, and glyphosate amazapir mow. You'll see we did not have a glyphosate alone treatment because we didn't think it would work, so we didn't even bother with it. Uh, we repeated this four times. Re replicated it four times. We sprayed with the highest label rate uh, and we mowed. When we did the mowing, it was three, four weeks after the herbicide application. All right. Oh, we had a lot of fun on all of these projects. Um, we needed a marsh master to be able to uh, operate in this site. And so the Marsh Master is this, this wonderful uh, machine. There's Krista right there for scale. Uh, so it's on tank wheels. It has less pressure per square inch than a human footprint. It can ride up on a levee, go down, float over the slough, and then get up into mushy uh, tidal mud. Um, the plant is very tall, so we use the height of the Marsh Master. To, these are the, the stakes, the treatment plots. I can't remember, these are like 12 feet tall. Um, we had to stake them in, and then some of them have a cap with a number for the drone to be able to see it. And then uh, we use the Marsh Master to put those in. And then we use the Marsh Master to do the first herbicide treatment. You can see we used a blue dye to see where we sprayed um, because to get up and over the plant, 10 meters is a big plot. Uh, we had a lot of avoidance minimization measures um, in for salt marsh harvest mouse so that they could get away from us. Um, a lot, a lot went into this project. Uh, here's a picture of this blue dye sprayed frag. And then the first year of treatment was so effective, we could actually get into the treatment plots. So we used uh, John Boats, backpack sprayers, and weed eaters for um, year, the second two years of the project. So uh, I'm gonna repeat something here. There are a lot of tools available to you in your toolbox to help you minimize the use of uh, chemicals and maximize the efficacy of your project, including amphibious vehicles. That's what we call that. Marsh Master's brand name. I should maybe take that out. Um, amphibious vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles, also called drones or UAVs, and then active revegetation is another one of those tools and techniques uh, for maximizing your, your efficacy. All right, we did a lot of monitoring on this, uh, um, a lot of physical vegetation sampling, so measuring the plants, a lot of water quality work, uh, and frequent drone uh, monitoring. The physical vegetation component was um, we used percent cover, looking at shoot count uh, of the Phragmites. We did a biomass collection um, to see how much was there, uh, stand measurements, a lot, a lot of things. Uh, water quality was really important, not only for compliance with our NPDES, our National Pollutant Elimination Discharge System permit, um, which you are required to do a water quality sample before your, within 24 hours before your herbicide application, during your herbicide application, and within 24 hours after or a week after your herbicide application. So three samples per site. Um, we considered each one of our plots a site. So we had three samples per plot because um, it's a study and we, we wanted to know what uh, how much of this herbicide actually made it into the water. Uh, so we did a lot of sampling for water quality and then drone monitoring. So this is a wonderful new tool uh, that gets you a lot of information very quickly, very efficiently, and you're not tromping around out there either damaging the environment or spreading weeds or you know doing all those things. So um, uh, this is the Drones that we have, uh, we get RGB, red, green, blue imagery using a Phantom 4, uh, multi-spectral imagery. You, um, you know, I'm not going to say this because it's not my area, <laughs> but you can see it. Um, uh, very cool tools that we have.
This is an example of the imagery that we get from drones, the RGBs, the red, the green, blue, and the multispectral. You knit all the individual images together into an ortho mosaic. So when I say ortho mosaic, I'm thinking I'm saying a big continuous image of the whole site. Uh, there's a resolution for the RGB is the 1.8 centimeter resolution or 4.2 centimeters. I mean, that's really cool. That's really good. All right, <clears throat> what do we do with these data? Well, we do an analysis using the normalized difference vegetation index, which I'm going to call NDVI. Uh, and this is a little counterintuitive the way that the image shows on a map. Um, because uh, green means either open water or nothing or or mud and red, like a bright red um, means um, happy, healthy vegetation. So you got to kind of flip this in your mind when you're looking at an NDVI uh, image. Um, the images, uh, the the scores are negative one to, to one or zero to one, excuse me, one being a happy, healthy plant. Um, and then, so I want to point out in these red circles here are our plots after the first year of treatment. So um, we are very encouraged to see the uh, plots not have happy, healthy vegetation, but more dying, dead vegetation. And let me just tell you a little quick story. Uh, after the very first herbicide application, oh my gosh, the plots looked like we hit them with miracle grow. We were like, oh my goodness, all the other frag was going to sleep for the winter. We call that senescence. It's a perennial plant. It's what it does. It'll come back happy and healthy in the spring. Um, but our plots were still like, ah, and the rest of them were like going to sleep. And we're like, oh my gosh, what have we done? But have no fear. I think what it was was a stress response. I think it was like, oh my gosh, we've been hit with something. We're stressed out. Let's try to really like, you know, ah. And then that ultimately was their doom. But yeah, that first that first drone flight was very nervous. Okay, well, let me tell you about these results. <laughs> first, I'll say that applying uh, the reason we applied when and we did two reasons. One, uh, we did our herbicide applications in September October because that was our permitted time to do it. That's when the endangered species are less likely to be in the area. Um, but it also is a really good time to treat perennial plants because perennial plants in the fall, like think of uh, your tree, it will um, leaf out in the summer. So all the, the stored um, carbohydrates in the roots are coming up to the plant and they're, they're creating new leaves and they're leafing out. So all their energy is going up. Then they're out, they're full leaves for the summer. Then they start translocating the energy in the photosynthesis sugars down to the roots for fall and to overwinter. So imagine you want to kill a plant. <laughs> you are going to want to spray it with an a systemic herbicide, the ones that kind of go into the plant, don't just kill it on contact. Uh, the systemic herbicides will go in and then translocate down to the roots and sit in the roots. That's what you want for a per how to manage a perennial plant. Because if you spray in the spring, you're wasting your herbicide. You're putting herbicide into the environment for no effect. Don't do that, IPM least herbicide possible. So we spray in the fall. Okay, so let me repeat that. Applying herbicides to perennial plants in the fall is the most effective and will ensure the herbicide will translocate down to the roots or rhizomes in this case, both. Okay, so this plot, let me orient you. We have all the treatments here in the different colors. The control treatment meaning we didn't do anything. That's red. And then uh, you have time over time on the uh, x axis. Uh, x axis yes <laughs> and the y axis up you have ndvi remember ndvi of one is a happy healthy plant and dvi of zero is a dead dead plant or no plant all right so all the plots were about the same when we measured them and then in october of 2019 we spray them with herbicide uh then they all go into senescence except we had a little little blippy blip maybe it's not on the graph we don't want to confuse anybody. Um, they all go into senescence when we did this drone flight. All right, we did another drone flight uh, at this time, and again, all the plots were, you know, still um, senesced, still asleep. Well, sometime between this drone flight and this drone flight, in late April, so between February and uh, April, May, uh, the control plot, which means we didn't do anything, woke up and did its thing. 
happy healthy plant in spring. NDVI is very high. All the plots that we treated were suffering. Look at that. And we did a couple more drone flights again, measuring against the control. As the, as the year goes on, we're like, sweet. All the treatments were effective. This is just the efficacy data. I'll show you the other data later. Uh, we did three years of treatment in a row, right? We learned we got we to gotta do multiple years of treatment before you go in with revegetation. Second year of treatment, boom, same thing. They all just naturally go into senescence. Um, and then this is a continuation of the same data just uh, now the next year. Uh, we did more drone flights again, spring, April, spring. They the control plot, the normal frag that we didn't treat uh, was happy, healthy. All the other plots were, were struggling. So that was great. Third year of treatment uh, and treatment is the herbicide and the mowing. Uh, they all go into senescence as expected. And then this we got some started to get some weird results. Uh, April 2022, the control plot was as expected, happy, healthy. <sighs> These ones were a little too happy, healthy for our liking. I'm thinking, dang it, uh, Phragmites. Um, so we went out to investigate. And what we found, and now this is the, um, one of the research questions we had was, what are the effects to non-target plants? Are we having uh, effects outside of our plots from drift? What's going on? We found, and again, this is, we don't have a lot of data, so um, this is just an observational. Uh, we didn't have a lot of replicates, but looking at the plots, so the glyphosate amazapir plot, the glyphosate mo, the amazapir mo, a regular amazapir, glyphosate amazapir, all of them, except for this one, had more native vegetation in it of percent cover than they had frag coming back or creeping in from the outside. So to me, two things. One, not only did we not have off-target impacts on the plants outside the plots, we actually encouraged some passive revegetation inside the plots. So that was encouraging. Uh, a masbeer. I want to talk about masbeer really quick. So we were, oh, thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, see, there's the picture. Um, this is the outside edge. This is the outside of the plot. And so inside the plot, these are tules. We did not plant those. We specifically chose plots that were solid frag, you know, within, you know, we didn't, we didn't choose, if a, if a randomly selected plot had anything in it but frag, we picked a different random spot. There were no other plants in these plots when we started other than frag. So there's me pointing at it. Woohoo! Um, Mazapir, quick note. Uh, at the time, we chose a Mazapir because that was, that was a good option. We learned in literature, this is the one. We have since, Learn from feedback that a masbeer has really long soil residual activity. I mean, it's good if you don't want frag coming back, that's great, but it's not so good if you want other things to come back. For example, our Delta Levees program sprayed a masbeer and a habitat restoration site and nothing grew for seven years, nothing. It has a long half-life. Um, so we didn't see that in our plots, as you can see, the masbeer, well, this one, um, but this masbeer plot, this masbeer plot, we had regrowth. There is a chance that the amazapir is locked up in the rhizomes underground and it might come out. Um, we're going to keep a good eye on that. Uh, another option will be amazamox uh, for moving forward, which does not have as good uh, as long of soil residual activity. We're consulting with PCAs right now, uh, pest control advisors, to, uh, to figure out the best way to move forward. But for the purpose of the study, this is what we used and these are the results in this location. Oh, this is one of my favorite plots. Um, can't remember what number it is off the top of my head. But uh, here's the drone markers uh, for the, the outsides of the plot. So you know, 10 by 10 meter plot. This is a giant patch of cattails in the very middle of the plot. Was not there three years ago. So this is why we were getting those high NDVI values for that last drone flight. It's not because the NDVI only measures photosynthesis. It doesn't measure what species it's coming from. So this gave me an explanation for those weird high and DVI results. All right. Water quality results. Yeah, so uh, glyphosate. So glyphosate um, is one of the we used. We did 196 water quality samples, had zero detections. 
We were not surprised by this because glyphosate adsorbs very, very tightly to soil and this water is very turbid. So the second glyphosate touches soil, it pretty much goes uh, away, inert. Um, and then the MPDES trigger is uh, 0 0.7 milligrams per liter. Okay, imazepir. We did find imazepir. We had 30 out of 210, 30 plots. We detected imazepir detectable in the water outside of the plot. Um, the maximum detection we had was 0 0.013 milligrams per liter. And this was several orders of magnitude higher than our next highest maximum detection. So this is, this is the highest detection we got by a lot. Uh, average, like I said, average detection was very, very small. 11.2 is the NPDES trigger. So we're orders of, orders of magnitude underneath a level of concern. It was there, we sprayed it. It was there a week later. We sprayed it, we knew it was gonna be there, but not at any level that we are concerned about for the species in the area. That was good. Um, oh, uh, let me repeat that glyphosate is not readily detectable in the water when you have very turbid water and a, a lot of soil mixed up in it. Okay, so moving uh, to the future, we're gonna take all of our lessons learned from the revegetation studies and this study, and we are going to fine tune our methods. Like I said, maybe add Amazonox into the mix, uh, revine our planting um, uh, active revegetation plant list, um, Think about tools that are available, such as drones um, for spraying. And we are going to do site-wide, full site-wide implementation at Blacklock. Um, and we're hoping that by doing this and doing this successfully, that it will facilitate the permitting for projects like this for all of you, for everyone in the Sassoon Marsh. So for site-wide treatment, we're gonna, we took, um, I took a note from the invasive Spartina project happening in San Francisco Bay right now, and we're going to divide the uh, area, it's a 90 acre site, into sections uh, for a couple of reasons. One, decrease herbicide load uh, into the delta at one, at one time, and two, to give any endangered species in the area or sensitive species uh, time to get out. So we're not you know, hitting the entire 90 acres um, with herbicide at one time. There's of the 90 acre site that we own, about 30 acres is solid Phragmites. We divide it into three, uh, roughly 10 acres of Phragmites in each section. Section one is gonna go first because it has the most native vegetation in it to start. So we're gonna hopefully allow that native vegetation to spread out. We're going to uh, treat by, uh, using a drone um, in uh, year one and we're gonna mow uh, if we can as needed and uh, we're buffering the mason's liliopsis. It's very, very important to know what rare and sensitive species are on your site that maybe can't get away from you. <laughs> so we're gonna buffer the mason's liliopsis by 100 feet um, so the drone will not spray near it in case of drift. Uh, we'll spot spray around those sites and then uh, after year one, after uh, the first year of treatment, we'll go in with spot spray to get any re-sprouts. We're gonna do uh, section one first, First year, section two, the second year, section three, the third year. We're going to repeat the treatments as needed for three years in each section before we start active revegetation. Uh, I just saw a question in the chat. What percent glyphosate and amazepir did you use in each application? We use the max label rate uh, or whatever that is. Or <laughs> Phragmites, I'm sorry, I don't know that off the top of my head. It's on the label. Uh, and then, yeah, and then we're going to be monitoring um, Boeva. I want to share this bit. It's pretty cool. Uh, I was watching um, a presentation by a Chapman University professor uh, who did a Phragmites study in another tidal wetland, not Blacklock. Um, but their uh, finding, this was very, actually pretty cool, was that uh, Phragmites actually can shelter invertebrates, maybe salt marsh harvest mouse, maybe birds from heat stress. So we get like week long, 100 plus degree days in Sassoon Marsh in San Francisco. Or that. You, you folks don't know about this, but we in Sacramento, in the Central Valley and in the marsh get 100 degree plus heat waves. So that's hard on, on a critter. Um, so we're not gonna be able to get the, uh, 
Phragmite is completely off of black lock. So the patches that have to remain or that we just can't get are actually going to be climate change refugia for these critters. And if we can keep them through using competition via active revegetation, keep the Phragmites in check so it doesn't take over again, I think this will actually be a benefit. It's also really good at accreting sediment, which will help the site keep up with sea level rise. There's benefits. Silver linings, you can't get rid of it all. So, you know, learn to play along. Uh, so this is just more, um, this is just a cool, Finding that uh, underneath Phragmites, there were uh, significantly more critters um, after a very long heat wave uh, than under the native edge. So I'll just say that one more time, that invasive Phragmites may provide some benefits to, um, to the habitats it has invaded. All right, let me wrap it up. So in conclusion, where uh, the title uh, restoration, there's a lot of tidal restoration happening in between the bay and the marsh and the delta, um, not just the fish restoration program. So a lot of folks are dealing with the problem of creating new habitat for invasive species. It's expensive and it's, we don't wanna put a lot of chemical into the environment. So what can we do and share this information with each other so that we can um, minimize the expense to our programs and the chemicals to the environment? Uh, the research is happening, so there's mine, and then I, I've been now I'm seeing all these other studies popping up. That's very cool. Um, yeah, go go us. Um, the I love this T-shirt from one of my team. Uh, it says, "If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it?" You know, so this is just take a step back, be humble. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, but what we can do is uh, try some things, experiment, and share out the information so we can hopefully iterate toward a more sustainable management of our resources. And so here I will, I will uh, and say for enhancement of you know restoration reboot, this is a these studies and the pilot project are a proof of concept. Uh, the question I posed to you in the beginning, is there something we can do at the design phase of a restoration site? or uh, after an invasive species has already established on a restoration site, is there anything we can do? We just throw up our hands. I will argue, yes, there, we can do something. And we can use, what we can do is use an IPM approach, um, both in the planning, all the way through the monitoring, but especially in the control portion of your project. Uh, remove the weeds if you can before you start. This may take multiple passes. Um, plant local, robust natives. Uh, native plants at a 25% reference density. Density don't 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 break your back. You don't need to. They will will fill in. And but you do have to tend to those plantings. Um, and I will venture a guess that within three years you will likely have uh, a sustainable IPMable restoration site. So we are implementing the IPM strategy. This is happening in real time. We have three of our two of our three big permits we need to do that scaled up black lock study, hopefully starting this summer. Um, so we'll, more to come on that. And hopefully the result of all of this is that it will facilitate other land managers work uh, who are trying to do this. I know folks like, it, it's very daunting to have to take on a permitting agency and these experiments were very expensive and they take a lot of time. So. If you don't have a tool, no one, there aren't a lot of agencies or groups that can, you know, invest six years and millions of dollars into just getting to this point of getting information. But I was very, very fortunate in uh, getting the grants and having supportive management at Water Resources and having an amazing team to be able to pull this off. So we're very, very happy to share it out. Uh, I know we have a, a Q&A session coming up and a DPR quiz, but before we do that, I really need to shout out to my project managers, Jamie Silva, uh, Dutch Slew. Uh, so that's him standing. This is what we had to deal with <laughs> at Dutch Slew. So here we are monitoring um, really positive attitudes throughout the whole thing. It was wonderful. Rhiannon Mulligan, uh, she did an amazing job on the Bradmore Reveg study. It's like, you know, we got this. It's all good. Uh, Krista Hoffman, who you've met, uh, she was the project manager who designed and got us uh, got us moving on the Black Lock Frag Mighty study. Here she is uh, having a snack under the shade of Frag, enjoying that uh, climate change refugia. 
And uh, then uh, Krista uh, moved and uh, promoted uh, now the IPM lands uh, coordinator for CDFW. Awesome. Uh, JT backfilled her position and, and helped us out uh, for uh, year two of the study. Um, he moved on and Madison Thomas is now our project manager. I was the interim project manager. I don't have a good shot of Madison, but there she is. This is my current team. Here's our awesome kayaks. <laughs> all right, that is all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Gina, giving okay. you some virtual applause here. Um, what an impressive amount of work and what a great team you have.